Thanks, Christian. And now, as ever, to the papers. Lots and lots of different front pages this morning. The Mail on Sunday there has a six-year-old being groomed for jihad in British suburbia, it says. Uh, there's lots more stories like that in the papers. Um, a terrifying, if true, story in the Sunday Express suggesting that air attacks on London, Brighton, Bath and Ipswich have been foiled after uh, the RAF overheard some pilots talking. Um, Sunday Mirror has got the Putin story again. Putin's killers left polonium trail at British Embassy. Everywhere they went, these guys left a trail of polonium. Not very clever. We'll talk about that later on. The Sunday Telegraph, quite a substantial story here, saying that 40 Tory MPs have demanded a meeting with the Prime Minister because they are so worried that he is not getting enough from our EU partners for his renegotiation. And Liam Fox has criticised David Cameron for going around Europe with a begging bowl, trying to get changes to the benefits system. Um, Scotland on Sunday, the Tories should cut tax with the devolved powers in Scotland. And finally, there's the Observer. Britain poised to open the door to thousands of migrant children. That's at the so-called jungle camp in Calais. Jeremy Corbyn has been there suggesting that Britain should now let in the children who are in that camp. We'll talk about, uh, about that perhaps, but we're going to start off with Anne Applebaum. And I said right at the beginning of the show, one of the big, big stories of the week has been the fallout from this Putin story. And you've chosen the Sunday Telegraph for that. Yes, I mean, one of the real oddities of this story is that it's happening now. Um, Litvinenko was murdered nine years ago. Um, since he's been murdered, almost everything that we knew then and, and what we know now hasn't changed. Um, almost nothing in the report was new. Um, and I think what the report illustrates is the real ambivalence that Britain has about Russia. I, on the one hand, you had a, imagine if Al Qaeda brought nuclear material into central London yeah. um, and, and, and began poisoning people. There would be an amazing outcry. People would be stopped. But because it was Russia, people were careful, hands off. And, you know, and I think it's, it's an illustration of, um, of, of, a, of a, a deeper problem in Britain. Or you? even if this had happened in the 1970s or 1980s from Russia. Hmm. There have been huge expulsions of diplomats, massive rows. Now, why is the ambivalence happening? Well, now? the ambivalence is happening because the city of London makes so much money off of Russia. And so many people indirectly or directly are connected to Russian money here that nobody really wants to object to it. I mean, why was Litvinenko here? Why were those guys here? Why are so many Russians attracted to London? It's because, because it's a money laundering it's because center, this is one where Russian they, says in today's Yes, papers. it's because this is where they can keep their money, where they can keep it privately, they can invest it in housing, um, and they can keep going. Well, I, I, when, I, when I look at this story, all I think is, well, you're telling me the British government or the British Ser Secret Services haven't, you know, assassinated people in Russia, you know, that we just don't know about. I find, you know, these are the kind of games that I'm they play. I'd be surprised if they've actually assassinated people. But I, would you? I would be surprised if they assassinated really? people using polonium, actually. Uh, yeah, using yeah, polonium, polonium, possibly, yeah. yes. Mm. But yes. clearly that was not a good idea, given that it left a trail all over trail London. No, they place. didn't clearly expect that, either. One of the big worries, of course, I suppose, by from Britain and other Western governments is... The, what, to what extent Putin could um, go rogue and go further if he's provoked, if he feels he's on the edge of losing power? Well, this oh. is very connected to your financial story. Uh, because one of the ways in which he stays in power is by creating crises, which he can then, he, only he can solve. I mean, he did it in Ukraine and now he's doing it in Syria. Um, and the question is, if he really begins to fall, be, be, be under challenge and as the oil price falls and so on, he may well be, what then? Well, maybe he'll decide oil prices need to go up and he needs to do something in the Persian Gulf, or maybe he decides he needs to destabilize Britain. Well, try, try and provoke some kind of conflict uh, there. Yeah, in no, order no, to... I mean, this one of the pe people cited, he, Edward Lucas has written quite a good piece in The Telegraph, um, and Edward Lucas is interesting because he wrote a book called The New Cold War, published 10 years ago, which at the time everybody thought was ridiculous, and then slowly... It comes, to, it comes to pass. I don't think Russia can control the global oil markets. One of the problems we no, have is that the oil, the American oil industry, thanks to fracking, is producing a lot more oil. And in fact, if you look at US oil stocks, they're at rec you know, almost record highs. So he may want to try to do that. And, and his economy is in trouble. The ruble's collapsing. The economy's in deep recession. It's clearly an oil and gas economy when the oil price is at record lows. I want to come on to the economy in just yeah. a second. Before we do, however, just finally on Putin, if he's pressed against the wall, how far do you think he might go in terms of Europe? Um, I really don't know. I mean, all we know is what he practices and what he does. I, we know what he trains to do. We know that when, when they do military, uh, military training in Russia, they, train, they practice the invasion of the Baltic states and they practice the bombing of Poland. And we know oh. that, absolutely, and we know that they, you know, Russian planes buzz the Swedish coast and they buzz, you know, they've been here as well. I, I, all had, we know I had is no that idea there was a Swedish-Russian standoff. Is that there, really is, there is a Swedish-Russian standoff. And now a serious Swedish desire to join NATO, which but, has not been 
been the case for half a century. But at the same time, Tim Peake is in the International Space Station only because he trained in Russia. Mm. The only way to get to the International Space Station, there's lots of European astronauts up there, is through Russia. That is the ambivalence we were talking about to begin mm. with. Less ambivalence, yeah. perhaps, about... Well, big ambivalence, I suppose, on the world economy. <laughs> are we on the edge of falling <laughs> off the cliff or are we not? Oh, who knows? If only I knew, Andrew. Uh, great piece in The People. I just love the cartoon. Um, uh, by Nigel Nelson, the political editor, um, not the economic editor, interestingly. Um, the thing about stock markets is they predict recession, but they're not always accurate. So there's a great expression that says uh, stock markets have predicted 25 out of the last nine recessions. So they tend to predict okay. them when they don't happen. Yeah. We've never been in this place before. China has been growing for 25 years. We have never been in the place where it's gone into a recession when it is the second biggest economy in the world. Yes. And there's massive uncertainty. We don't know if we can even believe the Chinese GDP figures that we saw out earlier this week. So... I, it's I guess just the, very, guess, very uncertain. I guess the argument to get about being too bearish, and I think Neil Ferguson has made this in the Sunday Times, is we are still in a position where there are lots of new commodities that people want to buy, whether they're driverless cars or iPads or whatever. Um, there is plenty of money in the world economy, and commodity prices like oil, which have gone down, inevitably bounce back up again. Well, I remember $9 oil way back in 1998, actually. So we'd back down to $27, which actually pre the boom of China is kind of where the oil price was. Um, and the, the point about turning points in economic cycles is that they're very difficult to pinpoint. So where you go down or where you go up, but they're characterized by market volatility, which is what we're seeing because we don't have enough information to know, but we have enough information to worry. And that's kind of where we are. So at the moment, we had record low unemployment in the UK, 5.1%, I think it was 5.2% mm. early this week. That's lower than pre the crisis. All of that looks good. And it's very interesting. There's a story in the Sunday Times um, about George Osborne yeah. getting a new kind of deal um, on, yeah. on a kind of a break on certain kinds of legislation for the, from the EU. But towards the end of that story, it says he wants an early referendum because he is so worried about what's going to happen to the economy <laughs> later in the year. And at that point, all the political class kind of lose control. Yeah, no, of course, that's the difficulty with referendums. It's very likely that the EU referendum won't be a referendum on the EU. It'll be a referendum on how people feel about Britain and also how people feel about the outside world. If mm. the outside world looks scary and frightening, then it's very likely people will vote against. Mm. Mm. And the extent to which, of course, the political class has any real grip on these big movements around the world and the, and the big players. There's a good piece in The Observer, Anne, I think you picked out, about the effect on London of, of the super rich. Yes, well, this is connected to what we were talking about before, that um, London has been, central London in particular, has been colonized by the very rich. And that's been true for many years, but it's the intensity of it and the, way, the degree to which prices are driven up, not just in property, but all over the place, mm. is, mm. of course, remarkable. And it's, what's truly amazing is that no political party yet has tried to capitalize it. Mm. Nobody, none of the mayor can, mayoral candidates. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. We're all very worried about migrants, poor migrants. But, you know, what, what about, about the super rich? What about the super distorting rich? Distorting all the markets. Mm. And, and this is a university report which accuses the London political elite of being, I think, the ushers and butlers or ushers and servants well, if you to think, the if, super rich. If you think about the number of businesses that spin off this phenomenon, you know, art dealers, concierges, um, mm. drivers, real estate and so on. It's, it's, it is a lot of people. The, the property industry. I was at a panel with a property industry. All, clearly, they all think it's marvellous that we've got lots of foreign buyers of London property because they're making so much money out of them. Um, and one of them said, oh, but we can have jobs because it's fine. You know, we have, we, you, you look after their house when they're away. And I'm like, well, the British economy cannot be based on housemaids, cleaners and painters and decorators oh. to you the rich, rich Londoners. And, and it also means that young people can't afford to live yes. in London and, and all kinds of things don't come to London because of it as well. And that, I think, is is a long-term threat mm -hmm. to the London economy, which is a bit of a powerhouse to, to the country. So we're talking here about how much handle local politicians, as it were, have over global financial mm. forces. And the story of the week is Google yes. and this deal for £130 million in back taxes that George Osborne and the Treasury has negotiated with Google. And this has been pretty much every paper, actually. I mean, clearly the left-wing papers are criticising it, saying it's that not the, nearly enough. it's not nearly enough. But interestingly, the right-wing papers are saying the same thing. Um, Labour are calling on the National Audit Office to investigate this agreement to pay £130 million mm. in back taxes. One of the papers has come out and said, well, actually, we've looked at the numbers. That only looks like a 2.6% corporation tax rate. It's not bad if you can negotiate which it. Which is not bad if you can negotiate it. The bigger picture is that Apple is currently negotiating with the EU, EU over its back taxes in Ireland. 
and that, according to some city analysts, could be billions, anywhere between eight and we'll make this look billion. particularly ridiculous. And we'll make this look particularly well, ridiculous. I talked to Nicola Sturgeon. We haven't been able to include it in the interview because it's been too long. But she said that the crucial thing here was transparency. Mm. That we need to see in detail how those negotiations went, how this figure was ag agreed mm. between the Treasury and and uh, Google. Couldn't agree more. Exactly. We we need the numbers to work out if we if we as taxpayers think that's a good idea, a good plan. Now, you, you, you mentioned Labour there. There's a lot of Labour in the, in the papers again today. Deborah Mattison, as we saw in the news, has blasted this review, review. And that looks to me like the Mail on Sunday, I think. Um, yes. I mean, I'm, this is kind of unsurprising, you know, dog bites man story. Um, <laughs> you, know, <clears throat> you know, the Labour Party, guess what? They publish an official report about why they lost the election. And then there's a private report which says something different. And I, I would be surprised if any political party um, wouldn't do the same. I, I think that the interesting question now is, <clears throat> you know, what were the issues that Labour missed? And is the new, is Jeremy Corbyn in any way fit to address them? Mm -hmm. And of course, the issues what we've just been talking about for the last five minutes are there. You know, the instability of the world economy, um, uh, the, the taxing mm -hmm. of global corporations, um, the hollowing out of London. You know, these were real mm -hmm. issues that people really care about. Yeah. And I didn't hear Labour mobilizing them in the last election campaign. So a, b a big gap there. Mm. Now, one other story that you've picked out there, Louise, is about faith schools. Yes. Another nagging pain. Nagging pain, yeah, yeah. especially uh, for those you know, wanting to get their children into schools. This is Sunday Telegraph. Faith schools to be protected from secular campaigners. Vexatious campaigners who want to ban the selection of people on the basis of religion um, as part of an overhaul announced today. I think this is absolutely terrible. It, it, I, don't, I believe that faith <coughs> schools should be completely banned and we should be secular education. My local school that my children have gone to, it's a great school to be fair, but 50% uh, of the places go to Church of England um, uh, regulars. And so I am discriminated against, and my children are discriminated against, because we don't play the going to the church game, which many, many parents do. And on that provocative note, <laughs> our time, I'm afraid, is up. Thank you both very much. Fascinating review. And